12 of the biggest soccer clubs around Europe have announced the creation of the European Super League, a sort of Champions League competitor that will see a dozen clubs compete with each other in a format that we've never seen in soccer before. Now, this has been, to say the least, controversial as fans from around the world have rallied against it. Both UEFA and FIFA have threatened major, major sanctions to any club that tries to compete in this. And it leaves a lot of us wondering what the hell's going on and is soccer ever going to be the same? Well, luckily, we have someone that can help us answer this question. We got Sean Goodwin here again, writer for the Kansas City Star, covering Sporting KC and the NWSL, and a lifelong Premier League fan specifically of Liverpool, the club that he grew up watching. So, Sean, Liverpool obviously is involved in the European Super League. Um, what uh, What is your reaction to all this? Yeah, Griff, I was going to say... You know, other videos we've talked about Sporting KC and the NWSL. And it's like, oh, he writes for the Star. That's relevant. But at this point, yeah, I sure I'm a Liverpool fan. I was born there. Um, <laughs> you've you got know, two that, tattoos of, got of uh, Liverpool. Liverpool yeah, that's why I'm here. Um, and, you know, I'll start this video sounding depressed and then you'll just rile me up and then I'll get pissed off. Um, <laughs> so it's like a normal yeah. conversation then. Yeah, it's just, it's despicable, and, you know, oftentimes when I do these videos, or even any other podcast and stuff, I'll, I'll prepare notes, and, you know, I'll, I'll know what I want to say, mm -hmm. but for this, it's just, it, it's pure emotion, I mean, it's, it's a despicable decision, and yes, we can pass through the facts and what it means, but at the end of the day, again, I, I don't really know what to say right off the bat, to be honest, because there's just so many things to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure we'll work through it over the next 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's a disgrace to football, it's a disgrace to the fans, mm -hmm. uh, especially especially for Liverpool. You know, that's always been a, a team of the people and, you know, you'll never walk alone, so on and so forth. Right. And uh, we've had ownership come in um, I've always been a proponent of Fenway Sports Group at the end of the day. They brought in Klopp, we won the Champions League, they brought in great players, we won the Prem. Right. Uh, this is one step way too far. Before that, they were operating within the laws of, not the laws, but you know, just the, the premise of typical football. Right. Uh, open fair play, promotion relegation. But this is, this is just dismantling the whole football pyramid. And that is a very, very far way too far step for me yeah i think uh this is something that you've brought up in in several of our many conversations talking about this that i think uh warrants kind of exploring a little bit more because this is definitely ownership driven i mean this is when you talk about it's not like they formed you know a management group and this is kind of an outside idea to get these teams involved i mean the president of the esl is the president of real madrid the board yeah. of the esl are all owners of these different teams so yeah. this is ownership driven primarily and three of the major owners that were involved in this uh, are American, uh, and, yeah. and they they own European or uh, English teams rather, and so I do think you know as someone who is on the opposite end of the spectrum from you, where I got into soccer later in my life, I didn't grow up with the game, and you know I grew up in the U.S., so I have a completely different view on sports and tradition because the American tradition is so different from the European uh, soccer tradition. Um, and so this this is a point that, that you have brought up several times, and I want you to kind of explain it, where you said that this is essentially the American owners not realizing that what what they're doing is has nothing to do with the European tradition because they don't have an attachment to that. Yeah, no, I don't want to you know, sit here and pretend that I'm American hating or whatever. I mean, I'm an American citizen now. I've been here 10 years. And, right. you know, we have a good friend of ours who says, ah, oh, it's just got anti-American bias or whatever he says. But No, it's, again, it's just, it's fair criticism. I think I think this yeah. is fair criticism to levy about American owners in a European sport where they don't have that level of connection that you and the rest of the fans have for growing up in it. I think it's fair. Yeah, I know. Here's my thing. So I totally get that 
again, the chairman is Florentino Perez for Real Madrid. And you've got guys like Roman Abramovich and whatnot with Chelsea. I get it's not all Americans, mm-hmm. but if you look at the um, the main board on this, you've got the president or whatever they call him, Perez. And I believe they've got five, like, co-chairman or vice-chairman. Yep, yep. And three of those big five, it's the three big Americans in this. It's mm-hmm. John Henry, friendly sports group of um, Liverpool. You've got Stan Kroenke with Arsenal. Obviously, he's in with um, the Rams. I yep. should mention FSG as the Red Sox. And then you have the Glazier family with Man United, who obviously also own the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So they right. still own the Bucs, right, Griff? Say again? They still own the Buccaneers, yeah? Yes, yes. They do, I thought so, yeah. So, it's Americans. They've, they've grown up with the American model. It's, you know, they've watched these sports and presumably, you know, I don't know the direct history of these families, but they've grown up in, a, in this kind of lifestyle already where they've, their family has bought into these teams a, a, a long time ago now for all of these groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it basically they prophesied off a closed system where, again, our good friend uh, Danny, he's a Red Sox fan. He's like, the Red Sox suck for 80 years. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Mm-hmm. They can suck as much as they want. They're still in the uh, major leagues. Mm-hmm. They're still profiting from all that money. And there's no concern. You know, it's a closed system, right? Right. Um, and, and every team has, like, you know, the Rams have had down years, the Bucks weren't any good, really, up until Tom Brady recently. Mm-hmm. But those those teams are still reeling it in. So you know you've got these American owners coming into Europe and buying all these European super teams. I say super teams, like you know, uh, historically big, you know, your Liverpools and Man Uniteds and so on and so forth. Right. You know, they're, bu- they're buying in at the top level already. It's not like they're coming in like in the fourth tier. Um, <laughs> and and they they wanna basically, for lack of a better term, Americanize this where. Is saying, hey, we can all get together. We can create this European Super League where there's no, you know, there's no relegation. It's a mm-hmm. closed system. You know, right. their idea is we'll have 15,000 teams in every year, and then we'll have five teams who qualify every year. It's like, oh, this is open, except the 15 teams can't get relegated. So it's <laughs> right. essentially a closed system where you invite some teams each year. Right, so it's just we'll get five teams to be food for these teams that, you know, never get relegated out of this no matter how bad yeah. they do. Yeah, I mean, hell, you know, let's just say Leicester, you know, these teams, you know, if, if they're kicked out of their respective leagues or not, I don't know, let's say Leicester qualify. I mean, like, let's not forget, Leicester made a course of final Champions League a couple of years ago. Leicester could finish fifth out of 20 teams if they qualified. Mm-hmm. But then, like, you know, we don't do as well in the domestic competition in the Premier League. And they go, oh, sorry, Leicester, goodbye. And then you've got <laughs> Arsenal or Tottenham or Inter Milan, who finished bottom. And they're like, ah, looks like you're a founding member. You can stay. And despite poor performance, mm-hmm. these teams just, they just get to stay in the league and they just keep rolling in that money. Look, I'm, I'm already fired up for like five minutes. <laughs> well, so what I think is important the the idea of americanizing it that that you said there is a there's a big difference between the american version of meritocracy in sport and the european version ultimately sports is the ultimate meritocracy right you have to be the best in order to win but yeah. there's a big difference between what that looks like in the us and what it looks like in europe so what it looks like in europe is promotion and relegation if you're not good enough you literally do not play here anymore Right. Uh-huh. That's, and and yeah. at the lower leagues, if you're so good that you beat everyone, you get the chance to play better teams. That is the European style of meritocracy in sport. The American yeah. style is much different. The American style is a an inverse system of bonuses that um, that promotes. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, equality and meritocracy. Well, yeah, well, well, parity. Yeah. Parity. That's the word I'm looking yeah. for. It promotes parity. So the idea of the draft, you know, where the worst team gets the first pick. So the worst team gets its shot at the best player. And that happens in every American league, even the MLS. That's uh-huh. the that's the American idea of meritocracy in sport. It's a closed system. You can't get relegated out of your league, but you get every opportunity to try to become better if you finish in last. That's the American idea. And, you know, we can go back and forth. Uh, about whether the MLS needs promotion, relegation, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And we've done it before and certainly we'll do it again. But 
that that is the the idea of what these owners are, are getting at and that's just yeah. that idea is not baked into the cake in europe that's not how it works there is no draft there is no the, the european system of bonuses it's not inverse so these kind of clubs the american owners specifically and again they they represent just three of the 12 but but admittedly three of the biggest drivers of this whole thing uh they don't seem to really understand that by removing the European meritocratic element that fans are so used to, in large part, they remove the part of football that fans have come to love so much. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, that was kind of one of the, that was part of the question you asked me earlier that I didn't really get to. Uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, ingrained in European soccer culture. Um, and I mean, I can sit here and just reel off examples of, Obviously, Leicester's one of those where they win championship and within a couple of seasons they come up and mm-hmm. obviously they win the Premier League. Right. But when well, you go you go backwards and you look at the teams that are being involved and even involved back in the oh let me see what um, century it was century what decade it was <laughs> um, before I... <laughs> Champion League um, when when was this? Presumably it was the twentieth we century. We'll start Got there. It. No. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, so 1980, um, Nottingham Forest win the Champions League. Mm-hmm. And yeah, okay, that's 41 years ago, right? Yep. Nottingham Forest guy have two Champions Leagues, and but just because you know over time they didn't keep up with the trends and you know they weren't playing as well, didn't recruit as well. However, it may be, they eventually now been relegated during the Championship, the second tier. But you know, they've been a lot than that. I remember giving League One at one point as well, the third tier. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, now you're talking about a club that has two European Cups that because of the way the English and just European system works, you know, they did not deserve to be at that level anymore and have since been, you know, relegated down yeah. to where they, you know, their level is right now. If you look at Juventus, they were relegated from Serie A in 2006. Drank it came right back up and now it's the Juventus we know and don't love. Uh, <laughs> But, but again, you know, it, that, that might not be the best example because it came right back up. But end of the day, it was one of these Super League teams that in the last, what, 15 years, just 15 years ago, they were relegated to the second division. Right. Um, and, but, and they rightfully, you know, they worked their way back up and they did it the right way. And now you're trying to, again, Americanize it. It's this American system where, again, it's, you know, I, I don't mean to pick on Tottenham, but they're only in it because I've, I was looking, I was talking to you about this last night, Griff. They're the ninth richest team in the world. Mm-hmm. But unless you want to go back to like I think like the sixties, where they have a couple of league titles, maybe um, they've done nothing except the league cup in the late two thousands. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arsenal is a you know Arsenal if Aston Villa wins their game in hand Arsenal is in the bottom half of the Premier League table yep and just because of you know the, it's like you say it's, it's owner driven it's money driven mm-hmm. they're being invited into the Super League we can get to playing it and you know they could lose you know 20 of the 20 games or however many games are going to be played and they just it's like oh no, well we'll just try again next year and because they're making so much money you know, hypothetically, if players want to... Obviously, there's a lot surrounding if players can play in the World Cup and Euros and... Right. There's a lot surrounding that too, but hypothetically, they can just still bring in the best players in the world despite playing at a very low level compared to the level that they're supposed to be playing at. And it's just... It's, it's not how football works in Europe. Yeah, I, I think... You know, let's get to some of these potential punishments that have been thrown out there by FIFA and UEFA and the English FA and things like that, um, because they, they are really major. You know, we're talking about a real seismic shift in the way soccer is played. So uh, UEFA has already threatened to kick any of these teams out of the Champions League that are currently playing now. Some people expect them to actually do that, and several of these teams are still in. And Real Madrid is still in, for example. Um, so UEFA has threatened to do that. FIFA has threatened to kick any player that plays on these teams out of 
any international competition. And when you look at these 12 teams, they're filled to the brim with with players that would be playing in the World Cup. They wouldn't be yep. allowed to if uh, if this rule goes through from FIFA and UEFA. They wouldn't be allowed to play in the World Cup. They wouldn't be allowed to play in the Euros, in the Gold Cup, and you know wh whatever the case may be. Uh, so they wouldn't be allowed to play in any of that. Um, the uh, various uh, football associations, specifically the English FA, has threatened to drop them from the league system entirely. Uh, yep. Which So you'd end up with a situation where this league that's supposed to be above even the Champions League features teams that don't even play in their domestic leagues anymore. So we're, we're talking about some really, really serious stuff that's going on here. Uh, this isn't just... You know, this isn't just like a small change that will kind of make the Champions League less fun to watch. This is yeah. th this is some real stuff going on. And for me, I think this could have the inverse effect on some of these big clubs. And I'll tell you why. So Barcelona is one of the teams involved in this whole Super League nonsense. And uh -huh. as we know, if you've been following soccer, Barcelona has been really struggling financially for months now because... They, buy, they bought a ton of players, they paid some massive salaries with the expectation that they would get certain bonuses from winning in La Liga and winning in the Champions League. They yeah. didn't achieve those results that they were expecting. So now, financially, they've been in real trouble for months because they don't have the money to pay the bills that they thought they might have. So it just, my point is, it goes to show you that you know these these clubs they're not as financially stable as we might think they all are you know at the end of the day they're making huge investments and if those investments don't pay don't pay off you know we're looking at these clubs potentially being in real trouble they still are operating on thin margins like most businesses are and so if something like this european super league is to happen and these teams get revenue get their revenue cut in a huge way the way that they may very well based on these potential sanctions that are happening uh we might end up with a situation where these clubs they just they end up going under because of the financial pressure that's being put on them do you think it's worth it for these clubs to even try to risk that well that's the thing i i don't think they will go under though i mean maybe long term definitely but i mean you have to look at the money that again i'm not sure you know, how 100% confirmed this is, but the current figure it's standing at right now is each founding member is going to be handed three and a half billion euros. Um, and I've heard that's now raised to four billion because the Super League is now trying to work out deals with Amazon and Disney and whatnot to stream the games. Um, so, you know, you mentioned Barcelona. Um, they are a team that's in financial trouble and this solves everything for them. At least in uh, the now, you know, down the road, who knows? Right. But um, but no, it, it's financially this solves any sort of problem for any of these founding teams, and it, that just goes back to the ownership. You know, they're just lining their pockets at the end of the day. Um, but no, go, going back to the other sanctions too. You know, we, we were talking about how teams, well, how players won't be able to play in the World Cup or the Euros or, like you said, the Gold Cup and whatnot. Um, I feel bad for the players involved because it that's almost you know they're just what's the word I'm looking for uh, they're getting hit by a straight bullet almost right yeah you know it's like, again because I'm most familiar with Liverpool since 2019 Klopp has been outwardly against this Super League mm -hmm. so you know I'm, I'm sure that hasn't changed so right off the bat that's Liverpool's head coach is against it I highly doubt the players are also for it they're yeah. probably against the two. So now the players are sitting there like, if this goes ahead and we're forced into the Super League by our ownership, now we can't play in the World Cup and the Euros. And, you know, we, we could be looking at a, a Euros this summer if, you know, let's just hypoth hypothetically say this all happens, where the top teams in the world aren't the strongest or the best teams anymore because they, their players aren't available. Mm -hmm. You know, um, England is going to be rolling out with Jack Grealish and Jude Bellingham, which great players, <laughs> don't be wrong, but it, it's not your, you know, it, it's not good top, it's not your Harry Kane's or your, right. you know, Raheem Sterling's and um, yeah. I would yeah. say Jordan Henderson, but I won't. I, won't. I was going to say Jordan Henderson, so I'll allow <laughs> it. 
Thank you. <laughs> I've also got some slander. <laughs> Not from me. You know, Trent Alexander Arnold, we'd still be stuck with Jordan Pickford and goal, unfortunately, but, you know, <laughs> got to take our losses race. But no. So I feel sorry for the players too, like some of the sanctions that could come for this. And yeah, that, that is where it does take negative. As you were saying, you know, and I was saying this earlier off the air, so to speak, you know, it's an immediate, you know, bankroll for these owners. Mm-hmm. You know, it's guaranteed money. But when or if it does in fact happen where these team, where these players can't compete domestically, can't compete for national teams, why the hell would any player outside the greasiest of those want to compete for these teams in this yeah. league? Well, um, I, I like, think you, you make it. You make a great point because in the short term, yeah, there, there's a lot of money on the line here. However, I do think long term, these players, they're they're not just. They're not just, you know, walking, talking wallets, you know, that just like suck in money wherever, wherever they can find it. Obviously, we as sports fans have been trained to to believe that money is a huge deciding factor for a lot of these players. And that may be true. In a lot of cases, it is, you know, because we as sports fans, we love talking about the contracts and, you know, the transfers and all that kind of stuff. So money is a deciding factor. However, uh, a- another buddy of mine, Adam, who who we've heard uh, on GA Sports a lot, he brought up a great comparison. He said, you remember, you know, five, ten years ago when the Chinese Super League got infused with a lot of cash with the sole purpose of bringing in major players to try to grow that league? And yeah. there was this fear that a lot of players would see the dollar signs and they would say, you know what, forget you know, forget the, the, the country I grew up in, forget the leagues I grew up, the teams I grew up watching, all this kind of stuff, all the history behind the Champions League and the Premier League and the FA Cup and all these, you know, the Copa del Rey, all of this. Forget all that. I'm going to go get some money in China. There was some fears that that is what would happen, and it never ended up materializing. You know, certain players went there. And, you know, maybe they wanted to get more money to secure their, their, their future and their so, family, whatever it is. But a few went. Most didn't. Most major players did stay. And that's without the threat of not playing in the World Cup the way that we're seeing with this. I will say on that side of things as well, that, you know, we did see some players, you know, head over there. And Denver Ball was one of them. Uh-huh. Um, I think Hulk, he went there. Hulk went. Was there a Chelsea player? It wasn't William, obviously. Who was the other? Uh, no, there was. Um, and I can't remember who it is now. Uh, um, but, but anyway, I'll let you think about that while I'm talking. Uh, maybe you can Google <laughs> it. But no, I think a big part too is... And, and goes on the Chinese Soccer Federation, or Football Federation, I should say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Oscar, recon- Oscar that's who it was. Yeah, that's right. They recognise that all of this money was, you know, coming into the Chinese game, which, you know, that's great for, you know, bringing in players and whatnot. But they... Sorry, that's a bit. <laughs> um, they, they basically, they set roster rules, kind of like what MLS has got in a sense, you know, like, you know, you can only have so many DPs and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. For China, uh, they said that you're only allowed three foreign players on the field for, at any one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know... All of these teams, yeah, they could, you know, they could definitely bring in some of these big European players on big money deals, and some players did do that. But the Chinese Soccer Federation also said, okay, hold on, we still want to grow the Chinese game. We want to still make good Chinese players mm-hmm. and not have not have them boxed out by all these Europeans coming over. Uh, so, you know, I do feel obviously more players could have to China. Adam does make a good point. But on the flip side, also it got to the point where these teams they couldn't really, you know, they couldn't just make a super team of Europeans because they could only play yeah. three at one time anyway. So that, that kind fair. of cared, that kind of curved that issue in China a bit. Uh, so I, I do think this is a little different, but I see where he's coming from. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I mean, also on the, uh, you're absolutely right, and it's a great point. Um, but you know, now looking at the potential punishments that would be levied to these players um you know we might be looking at a similar situation it's not a strict limitation in terms of foreigners like you said but you know there are a lot of players like look they're uh, the players that we're talking about they make a lot of money and 
so for them for someone like let's say a jordan henderson and england was so close to winning a world cup in in 2018 and you're talking about you know a few bounces a few calls go differently and and you know football may have been coming home as they say so for henderson if it's, <laughs> well I, I mention it just for this so England obviously has very high hopes, not only for the Euros this year, but also for the World Cup in 2022. So for a player like Jordan Henderson, he makes a lot of money playing for Liverpool. He's been paid a lot of bonuses. Liverpool has won the Premier League. They've won the Champions League. So for Henderson and players like him, are they looking at this and saying, you know what? It's not worth it to do this if it means that I'm not going to be able to represent my country when my country was inches away from winning a World Cup. That's the goal I have now. I mean, I... I I yeah. have to believe that there are a lot of players out there that do take representing their country seriously. And if they're not allowed to do it, then, you know, like, I, I have to believe that that would be a, a, a major sticking point for them when it comes to joining something like this. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of put all in once, you know, one segment. Uh, I guess I don't have too much to add. You're completely correct. It's a... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I have nothing else to say. You know, he's obviously you will get some players who kind of take the money, and then I think if this was to materialise, any of the players with any sort of shred of self-respect uh, and want to, you know, like at the highest point for any um, any player is representing the national team, right? Right. You know, if, if you represent them to a World Cup, then I guess that's higher. But you know, for 99% of players, it's, yeah, represent your team just at the national stage. That's the highest you can get. Mm-hmm. And if that's being taken away from these players, I think that's a, a very, uh, not a very appetizing prospect for players heading into this. So we yeah. all get to the point where the only players who we get playing for these Super League teams are players who just care about the money. And then I don't want to generalize all players, but oftentimes when I think it's, this is the case across all sports. You know, you see a player might just be there for, for the money. Mm-hmm. They don't perform at the highest level or they don't care as much yeah. as a player who get fighting for get fighting for the team, get fighting to be on the national team, get fighting for the fans. Yeah. And I think you also lose the aspect of things when if this was to happen, those are the kinds of players you, you the only type you'd be able to bring in. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, that trope has existed for years. I mean, specifically in the U.S. So most of our viewers are going to be coming from the United States. And for decades, we've had the trope of, you know, the contract year. We know that players play. I don't know if if a little harder is the is the correct expression, but there's this idea that, you know, the last year of a player's contract when, you know, he's playing to earn more money in his next contract that you know that year tends to be pretty productive for him and then there's there's always the question that's asked whether it's fair or not once a player signs a big contract is if he's going to give that same level of effort now that he's got the money in his pocket you know so that that idea does exist that once you've got that money uh you may not see that same level now again that may not be fair for for a lot of players but it does exist well that's good that's the thing with college basketball and the nba right Mm-hmm. I know both, both of us aren't a fan of the NBA and you know I, I've definitely made people angry with this um, this take but you know it, it's the whole stroke and you do look at these NBA scores even with the extra time over college basketball those kinds of scores should never be getting met and it's just because it, it's all offense think of his guys you know uh, Pop, Ever- Pop Everly is that his name? There, there is, yeah, Pat, I, I, I know where you're going yeah. with this. Yes, Pat Beverly, yeah. that's who it is. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's how unfamiliar I am with the NBA, honestly. I, I know <laughs> names off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, we're all guys who play defense. Um, I think Lonzo Ball plays de- decent defense. You can know that one, you Griff. Yeah, uh, yeah, Rudy Gobert. Yeah, there are guys. Yeah. Get both, both, for the most part, it's not, right? Yeah. It's, it's not the best defense because these guys, for the most part, they're in the league, NBA contracts are stupid, they've earned their money. And for the most part, even if they're a guy sitting on the bench, they know they've made it. These college guys, they don't have a contract, they're not being paid. Mm. Um, they're playing likes out to get to that point. Uh, so, so, you know, m- money definitely, you know, it does play a part in any sports or any athlete's, you know, mindset, I suppose. Right, right. At, at the end of the day, 
if that opportunity, if, if me and you were sitting here now, Griff, and we were, and you were like, ah, oh, you know, you can, you know, you, you can play for a, a bog standard team, or like, let's say you could play in League One mm-hmm. and make, you know, 40 grand a year, or you can play in the Premier League and sit on a bench and make 10 mil a year. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, that is going to play a part. Obviously. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, like, like if I, if you offer me forty k a year or ten mil a year, who who the hell do you think I am? I'm taking ten mil, <laughs> but but at the same time, when you do get to those higher echelons of the game, most of these guys are making so much money anyway. Yeah, you know, you do want to start winning trophies and building a legacy. Uh, I mean, you look at Harry Kane; he's I think he's what he's what twenty eight now. I think like he's he's mm-hmm. getting on, uh, and you. You know, three years ago, I remember him saying when Tottenham was building a new stadium, like, oh, I see this club winning trophies in my time here, and he signed a six-year contract, which I was making a lot of money, but he had the aim to win trophies, and Tottenham's not doing that. As we talk about this, they, they fired Jose Mourinho, mm-hmm. what, a couple of hours ago, about six hours ago? Yep. Um, and now, you know, there's rumours of Harry Kane wanting to leave, not for the money. He's at the top of the game, he wants to win trophies. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of bounced about over these last couple of minutes. I get that, but uh, well, the, yeah. The central, the central point you're making, I think, is money does play a role. However, yeah. it plays a role in, you know, if you're not making a lot, you want to make a lot. You know what I mean? So Jude Bellingham yeah. is a perfect example. You mentioned him earlier. He's, uh-huh. I mean, he's a he's a he's a a, a wunderkind. You could call him. You know, he's a, yeah. He's a super prospect, and you know he came up through his club's youth youth system. I'm I'm forgetting exactly uh, which club it was. Birmingham. Birmingham. That's right. That, thank you. So he can you know he comes up through the academy. He has an attachment to this club, and ultimately he gets offered a lot of money by Borussia Dortmund to go there. And obviously he's attached to Birmingham. Birmingham is attached they, to him. They retired his number. The kicks <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, the, money does play a role, but that it plays a role in that. So now Bellingham, he's making more money than he could ever know how to spend at Dortmund. So if someone offers him more money, if, if let's say Chelsea offers him more money to come back, there will be different considerations for him now. You know, yeah. when it was Dortmund offering, the money was the biggest consideration, but now it's something different. So the central point you're making is that for all of these teams that are in the European Super League, for all of these players, there are going to be other considerations. They're already making more money than they know how to use. So yeah. there will be different considerations for them. We know that. And these potential punishments that are being levied by FIFA and UEFA and the FAs and all this, that will, I think, weigh heavily on a lot of these players. Um, You know, uh, Adam brought up another great name. Messi is a guy who has won literally everything there is to win. He may be the greatest soccer player that ever lived, but he hasn't won a World Cup. And he said time and time and again, that's the trophy I want. And, you know, if, if he's being asked to choose between this random European Super League that means nothing and potentially a little bit more money and winning a World Cup, I think there's no doubt what exa- oh. what exactly he would want. Messi has more money than a than hundred people could spend in a lifetime. If so, I was him, I'd be so quick on the train to Aston Villa if I was him. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's the yeah MLS. I mean, he's talked about going to uh, to MLS Inter Miami, David Beckham's club. MLS is a serious option for him. By force asking Villa would be funny. Can you imagine <laughs> the, the terraces of um, Villa Park <laughs> singing Messi's name? <laughs> Golden. I'm just I'm I'm picturing that image. I'm picturing him going to like to like <laughs> Norwich now. Norwich just got promoted yesterday. They secured promotion yesterday, so I just imagine him going there. So Norwich fans are just, you know, they're thinking, okay, you know, we've got, we've got this, we've got this English boy ready to come up, and we've got this academy kid, and then just Messi shows up. Oh, they don't, yeah, they don't give him the number ten because they're like, oh, well, he's he's not from England, he needs to earn that shirt. So you got Messi out there yeah. wearing like number twenty three or something. You know, you know, Walkie, he'll go to Norwich, 
Um, yeah, we're going. He's going to Norwich now instead. Him and Team Upuki will uh, go match up. <laughs> They'll score the league. They'll score fifty goals between them, and Messi will have forty-eight of those. <laughs> It'll be the greatest partnership in Premier League history. Maybe the European Super League is a good idea because now I want to see that. Yeah, <laughs> I want right. to see. I want to see. Me- I want to see Messi versus well, Ronaldo, but Messi's with Norwich and and Ronaldo's with Newcastle. We're done. We're done here. Call it. We're quick. <laughs> we are for the Super League. <laughs> On board Forza. with the European Super League. We are Forza Florentino Perez. <laughs> That's not the turn I was expecting this video to take, but here we are. I know. We've enticed ourselves with the possibility. Here, here's a here's a serious question though, yeah. because I want to ask you this. So there there is a there is a legitimate desire here for these big clubs. You know, there the the idea of making money, right? That is legitimate. I mean, everyone wants to make money. Everyone wants to secure their, their their family's future. So from the players up to the owners, it's legitimate to say, look, we want to make a lot of money. This is this is how we see the best way to do it. And we've argued, uh-huh. you know, I've said that maybe <clears throat> maybe there's less money to be made here than than the owners think there is. And you know, whatever the case may be. But the point is it's a legitimate desire to try to to try to make money. And that is ultimately where this grows out of. Um however I think there's an issue here. The issue is the system in Europe, uh, the football associations are government entities. The leagues are not private businesses. The leagues are the government, essentially. The teams are the private businesses. So to go back to the comparison between the European system and the American system, these owners, these American owners that own American teams, they compete in a they, they or they they own teams in a system where franchises don't compete against each other. Franchises yeah. are subsidiaries, and the league competes against each other. So to take an example, McDonald's franchises on First Street and Tenth Street don't compete against each other. McDonald's competes against Burger King. So that is yeah. what we see in America. The NFL competes against the NBA. Yeah. But the Dallas Cowboys don't compete against the New York Giants. They're on the same playing field. And that's not how it is in Europe. And I do think that, that the, the competition between the teams themselves is actually what causes this. Because this is ultimately a way for Man City, for example, to say, like you know, either. say yeah. again? Like they need it anyway. Well, yeah, yeah. But I'm just, as an example, yeah. Man yeah. City is saying, look, we need to corner the market. We need, we need to become the biggest soccer club in England to corner this market. And how do yeah. we do that? We need to make sure that teams like Newcastle and Norwich and Leicester and teams like that, that they don't have a chance to take away our fans. Once yeah. they do that, then they can turn their attention to we need to corner Man U out of the market. We need to corner Chelsea out of the market, you know, and continue to go like that. In my opinion, so I am as I am as much of a free market capitalist as you will ever find in the world. But even the free market has limits, and this is a limit. Sports franchises should not be competing against one another from a business perspective because this is what happens. It's ultimately yeah. bad for the fans to see competition like this between sports franchises. And, uh, and for me, I think that if we are able to avert disaster here with the Super League. If it ends up not happening because of all these, you know, potential punishments and sanctions that that are coming down and all of the legal action that's sure to follow, even if it doesn't happen, I do think we need to look at exactly what factors, uh, you know, cause this to happen. And I think I think that's one of them. Yeah, no, it's you're completely right. But at the end of the day, I think. Club, the clubs physically competing against each other that just goes back to you know that's what the European model is right yeah like, yeah. like you, you can't have promotion relegation um, unless there is like an agreement that when a club enters your league you know, they become technically you know your ownership almost kind of deal um, but especially with all the competitions in Europe and everything the, the soul of European soccer and the, the football and pyramids is the fact that these teams do compete against one another. 
um, like what the solution is to fixing that. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it is some sort of, you know, um, like roster regulations or, you know, and yeah, we're going to idea of salary caps and transfer caps and whatnot yep. to, to make sure that these teams, no matter what they try, they can't just run away with all the money. Because that's what we've seen over the past 15 years anyway, right? Yep. You know, it, it semi-started with Barcelona and Madrid, but I think the big one was Chelsea went from a mid-table team to champions and cities did it five years later. Yeah. Uh, you know what's, what's funny about specifically Chelsea – uh, I came in to my soccer fandom in what 2000 like 2010 2011 um, yeah. so it was Chelsea right was when you. say again like Chelsea was a big team for you in your mindset at that point exactly so Chelsea was on the ascendant and that was I mean rather than being on the ascendant they were dominant already by that time so it was yeah. kind of a surprise to me when I learned that Chelsea doesn't have the history of Man U and Liverpool and teams like that, you know, where I'm like, wait a minute, Chelsea's been dominant. How are they not on that level? And then, you know, you come to realize that they get this massive influx of money in the early 2000s, and that's what it looks like. And then, as you say, same happens for Man City. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, let, let's go ahead and let's say that this Super League does happen, and then, like you said, then Man City's like, all right, how do we call our outs? Like start at the bottom. How do we call on Arsenal and Tottenham? Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe Chelsea, Liverpool, Man U, and City. And I like to call on these guys out. Right. And it's like you know, you, you have your group chat with all your friends, and there's four of you guys, and then you have a separate group chat with just three of you guys, and you call on someone else, and then it's two of you guys, and then there's just you by yourself, angrily muttering <laughs> about the European Super League. <laughs> just in the corner of your room. You're speaking yeah, from I'm- experience, I see. Yes, absolutely, I am. That's what gave me the idea. Isn't that sad? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, that's essentially what we're seeing. At what point does it stop? You know, already we've got these teams now seeing themselves as superior and because they're competing against each other. Yeah, they, they are saying, how can we put the final nail in the coffin almost to to stamp out these quote-unquote lower, but if not rising teams, I mean, you look at Leicester over the last couple of years, um, West Ham's a bloody pain in the arse right now, <laughs> Everson just brought in Carlo Ancelotti. Right. I mean, hell, up until the past decade, when honestly it was the Gareth Bale sign and that gave him a little bit of hope, Tottenham weren't even that relevant. I mean, they were a Premier League team, but again, the, not since, you know, the 70s and 80s were they really a uh, a top four, top six team. Right. And Tottenham is kind of snuck into this. Again, it's good money. God knows how else they're here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're like, you know, these teams are starting to catch up to us because at first, outside of Liverpool and Man U and I guess Arsenal, you know, it, it was, at least they were up there on merit. Yep. And then these rich teams came in and they jumped to the top. And now it's getting back to the point where, because especially the Premier League, other leagues, it's not so much like, you know, you see, I guess Juventus has kind of fell off. Um, Bayern Munich is dominant as always. PSG is kind of iffy, but they've always kind of been iffy, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, well, let's just say the Premier League, because there are six Premier League teams joining this because um, of a TV deal. Now all these other clubs are getting so much money. They're catching up. They can spend like the big boys pretty much. Maybe not to the same extent. Yep. But they're also not miles behind the pack. They're now like shit. How can we? How can we push them further away? And because it is a competition, because it is you know, it, it's individual businesses competing against one another. It's the big boys have said, all right, let's do this. Let's let's put some distance between these teams again and make sure we stay at the top. Yep. I think that is the issue, which you, at least you don't see with American sports. And it's one of the great things of the parity of American sports. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, like, let's let's look uh, Champions League 2011. Let's look just 10 years ago because there is this idea, um, and, and I think it's natural, especially in the social media age, to believe that what's going on now has always happened. You know, the, and, and we see it, it's not, we see it in sports, we see it in politics, it's everywhere. There is this idea, you know. But let's just look, 10 years ago, 
in the Champions League, say in like the round of 16, right? You've got your Man U's, your Chelsea's, your Arsenal's, you've got Real, you've got Barcelona. But the, the, the dominant teams 10 years ago, Schalke was in the Champions League semifinals. Copenhagen was in. Uh, you've got Shakhtar was in the quarterfinals, right? Uh, you've got, I mean, the point is that there is parity. There, there is change in in sports yeah. and even in soccer where there isn't a salary cap, you know, things to, and drafts and things to ensure parity the way that we have in the U.S., there is still a lot of parity. And so things yeah. change. It's not always these teams, these 12 teams have not always been super teams, you know, the yeah. way that, that, that they're now calling themselves, the Super League. But it hasn't always been like that. It's not, and to your point, it's not even like that now. I mean, yeah. Tottenham and Arsenal, they don't have the trophies. Tottenham doesn't but, have the trophies. Arsenal's in the bottom half of the league. So they're not even super teams now. Tottenham and Arsenal are not right now. I mean, for years, you know, I mean, Juventus, Juventus is actually in fourth place. It looks like Inter, Inter Milan is going to run away with um, Serie A. Mm-hmm. But just a couple of years ago, both Inter and AC Milan were mid-table teams, got our fluctuations. Yeah. Um, in 2004, uh, Porto won the Champions League. Porto hasn't even been invited to this Super <laughs> League. But like we you know, we keep hearing that PSG and Dortmund and Bayern all declined. They didn't even invite Porto. Yeah. Um, well, like Ajax the, is one of the most successful teams on the European stage Ajax. ever. Yeah, Ajax. So, you know, it does fluctuate and it's like, you know, we, we've kind of reiterated this and like you're saying, it does fluctuate and uh, hell, a decade ago, I was watching Liverpool run around with Roy Hodgson playing bloody <laughs> Mario Balotelli and Christian Benteke up top and Ricky Lambert scoring zero goals between them in like half a season. And I'm like, what the hell am I watching? <laughs> um, and yeah, obviously we've risen from the ashes but yeah, it's you know the, the top teams do always tend to circulate back around, and you do see that in American sports too. You know whether it's the Yankees or um, you know the, I guess the Patriots like the dynasty, I guess. But you know the, those teams always seem to always be around. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's the same with European soccer. Like, yes, those teams are always around. Manchester United is always around. Bayern's always around. But if you're going to put these teams in a super league that says you guys are the best teams and you guys play each other every year and then how it could be a Manchester United they gave them his fourth the last eight Champions Leagues Bayern could have a dip Juventus again they got relegated in 2006 yep, teams exactly. have dips and, and you're now saying you guys get to play in the super league together yep. and one of these teams a couple of these teams could have a couple of really bad seasons there could be teams you know, like a, a Leicester or an Atal- heck, Atalanta in Syria is in third place right now. Exactly. They were, they, were a champ- they were seconds away from a Champions League semi-final when they choked to PSG last year. Yep. Like, being it's away and those goes overtime goal or um, extra time goals. Yep. Uh, and now they're just being pushed out saying, oh, sorry, you're not allowed. While there could be teams floundering in the Super League because they're having down years. It, it, it just makes zero sense, I'm sorry. And you can argue that, let's say these FIFA sanctions, you know, they don't happen. FIFA and the uh, FAs, they bow down. They go, oh, I'm sorry, you can stay. Like, we don't want to lose you, and this does happen. And then you can argue, well, these teams will have so much money, they can buy the best players regardless. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that's a guarantee. Honestly, I don't think it is either. I do think long term, this whole thing hurts a lot of these clubs that that are going to be in it. I don't see because I ultimately what what I see is the fan base being absolutely divided because you're going to get a lot of the fans of these clubs that that do watch they support their clubs because, as you say, you, you have a real emotional attachment to the club. So you're going to get fans that, that do watch. And you're going to get casual fans that see Super League and they're like, oh, well, you know, I want to watch uh, Liverpool play Barcelona. I want to watch Real Madrid play uh, Juventus, you know, things like that. Yeah. So you are going to get that in the short can I term. Can right real quick? Yeah, no. So I am um, so, you know, right after we're done here, you know, I'm, I'm going to drag my sorry ass to my local pub and watch Liverpool and 
be pissed off, but I'm still going to watch them. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, we have a group chat, uh, like, you know, with a bunch of people who go, but we have a main group chat of eight guys who are we're kind of like, we go every single game. And we were arguing last night about this, and one of them was like, ah, oh, well, you know, it's the best versus the best. Who doesn't want that? Like, it's just not like that anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here like, hell, we won Champions League two seasons ago. We won the Premier League last season. And now you were going to sit here acting like a, a big dicks on the block. Yep. Because we've won, we've had two good seasons when a decade ago we had Roy Hodgson and we were finishing in eighth, ninth place. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, just this season alone, we lost six straight home games to Burnley and Southampton and... You know, I'm not knocking Everson, they look really good, but we lost to Everson at home, and there's probably all other, other games that I've just kind of blocked out of my memory that we lost as well. Yeah. Um, we, we do not... Liverpool don't deserve to be there at this point. We might not even make top four at this point. And because we've had two successful seasons, a bunch of fans are now walking around swinging the dicks around like it's Liverpool of the 80s. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this isn't... This isn't your Liverpool of the 80s that one three Champions Leagues or European Cups, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I mean, forget all that. Let's say for the sake of argument that these are the actual 12 best teams in the world. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. They're, they're, They're clearly not. You have teams that are better. But let's say for the sake of argument they were. If that were the case, the Champions League is so special because it means that once a year you get to see the best teams in the world lock horns. So once a year... You, you maybe get to see, you know, Barcelona versus Liverpool. And it was this incredible yeah. moment. It yeah. was this great opportunity. And yeah. now you're going to get to see it every year. There is no novelty anymore. I mean, so I didn't realize this, but Liverpool and Real Madrid have only ever played seven times in their history. Um, you know, we, we just played the knockout stages, um, you know, the quarterfinals, which we lost. We were in the group stages with them a couple of years ago. Uh, we played a, a knockout game in like the 90s against them, and then obviously the final in 2018. Yep. Um, that's two of the biggest teams historically in world soccer. Mm-hmm. And we've played seven times in all of those decades. Like, that is a huge deal. And, you know, I mean, unfortunately, we came across them most recently. I mean, our last couple of meetings with them have been dreadful. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously we just lost this Champions League game. We lost the final. They smashed us in the group stage. Um, actually, it was in the, it was in the two thousands we played Madrid and we beat them four 0 It was great. I remember. <laughs> but you know, but it's these things come around rarely, and it's an awesome moment when you get to watch them. Yeah. And we're go- we're going to sit here and but let's say. The Super League gets what they want, and they get 15,000 teams. You know, they, they managed to drag in a, a Porto and a PSG, I don't know. And then they just play each other three times a year, four times a year. Um, it, yeah, it's like, it, it's boring. I don't want to watch Liverpool play, you know, these PSG and Juve and Barca and Real every week. Yeah. Because it, it, it loses the flair, it loses the attractiveness. Because the whole point is these teams are the best from their countries and now we get a chance to prove we are better than you on a, mm-hmm. a, a one-off or a double, you know, two-legged moment. Yeah. And you lose that. Um, I, I have no issues. If Honestly, going into this Liverpool Leagues game, I don't even know if, if we finish fourth. I don't even know if we're going to be in the Champions League next year with the fallout of this. Yep. And I'm just like, you know, it, it's making me care about this game less, for sure. I'm, I'm trying to stay be hype about it because fourth place could mean Champions League, I don't know. But I, I've always loved playing your, you know, your Aston Villas and your Leagues and your Southamptons and Burnleys and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But it, it's a different challenge. They play differently. Um, you know, Ben Meek or Pocket Salah and everyone's like, what the hell's going on? Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's... Objectively, it's fun. It's fun yeah. watching teams lose. To, I mean, you know, leagues just leagues is a mid table team right now. They just beat Man City two one last week. Yeah, and we're going to sit here and pretend that yes, over the course of the season, Man City's far away, but leagues can clearly just show they can beat them. 
and now yeah. they're going to pretend that Man City deserves to be in this upper echelon of soccer and leagues doesn't. Like, it's, it's... I don't know. I enjoy those type of games where it, it's your week-to-week Premier League, you know, it, it's you're showing the best of the best in your country. Yeah. And when you, you qualify for the Champions League because you deserve it, and then you're given a chance to fight with the big boys. It shouldn't just be handed to you on a silver platter. Yeah, well, it's a classic. It's a classic, you know, cold rainy Tuesday at Stoke argument. You know, anything yeah. anything can happen in these types of games, and the Super League is basically taking that away. That it doesn't, yeah. even if you know, let's say the FA does relent and they do allow Liverpool and Chelsea, Man City, Man United, uh, you know, to play in uh, in the Premier League, that cold that cold rainy tuesday at stoke that is the difference between finishing fourth and finishing fifth that was a huge huge difference up until now and yeah. now it means nothing who cares about that cold rainy night at stoke because <laughs> it doesn't matter they're gonna be they're gonna be playing in the super league anyway so who gives a shit it's that and then you know i feel like all the emphasis would be on the super league unless you are in contention to you know win the premier league obviously it's another trophy but let's say Man, let's just say it's another season like this. Man City has run away with it. Um, we play Leeds today. If we win today, um, you know, we'll granted Chelsea will have a game in hands, but we'll go into fourth place. Mm-hmm. That's huge for us right now. With six games left after today. Um, if fourth place doesn't mean anything, and um, let's just say you know we get all this money and Liverpool goes and gets Jude Bellingham, and in six years he's like one of the best players in the world. Or mm-hmm. let's say, you know, we go out, even now, we somehow buy Mbappe or we buy Haaland. And we're sitting here and we're like, why don't we play our best players when we're playing Juventus midweek? <laughs> and then we go out and, and we treat the Premier League and we treat finishing fourth place like it's a League Cup game against Leighton Orient. Exactly, exactly. Because you're saving your best players for the midweek game against Juventus for the fourth time this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no there's no provision in the ESL either. I've never seen anything about what happens if one of these teams gets relegated. So what happens if Arsenal says, you know what, we've got eleven great players that we want to use, and they will not yeah. play in the in, in the Premier League, or they're not going to play consistently in the Premier League. So what yeah, happens mate. then? What if Arsenal gets relegated? Well, who cares? They're in the Super League. It doesn't matter to them. That's where they yeah, get all their money. And yeah, and like Alexis City and pretend it's rare. I mean, again. I don't even really keep bringing it up. Literally 15 years ago, Juventus were relegators. <laughs> you know, it, it, it would be a rare occurrence, don't get me wrong. Um, but how? Again, under our Roy Hodgson years, right before he was fired, I remember being 10 games into the season and being like, oh shit, Liverpool 17th. We genuinely suck. Yeah, well, that just happened to Man U a couple of years ago. They were in the drop zone in like 10, 15 games in or something like that. Yeah. It, it does yeah. happen. All of those clubs eventually survived it, but yeah, it does happen. Well, I mean, there there are only a few clubs that that don't survive. You know, the the Portsmouths of the world that that were major Premier League players and then got relegated and have never recovered. That's it's rarer than the kinds of teams that you know are great in the Premier League, but then they end up you know, getting relegated and they kind of bounce between leagues. I mean, it just happened to Leicester. Leicester was in a relegation battle not three years after they won the Premier League. You know, these things do yeah. happen. And so it's it seems I'll, – I'll, I'll, I'll end with this example from, from my dad. And my dad is not a huge soccer fan, but he watches with us, so he kind of knows what's going on. He's, he's your definition of a casual fan, right? Yeah. So we're talking through all this. And he says – ultimately, you know, he says – well, why, sh- why should I care about the Super League? He says, I care about the Champions League because those are the best teams. You have to earn your way into that. Yeah. Why should I care about the Super League when Arsenal could get relegated and they'll still be playing in it? Then it's just yeah. a collection of a dozen teams that have a lot of money. But it, it has no bearing on how they actually do uh, in, in, in the real world playing soccer matches. He says... I don't care about it. There's no reason for me to care about it. And I absolutely agree. There is no reason to care about the European Super League. It's 12 good teams playing each other. It's this it's like a preseason tournament, you know? It's like the International Champions Cup. It's, it's I don't give a, a shit about the International Champions Cup. It looks like a FIFA tournament. I don't know. Again, I've not bought FIFA in years garbage game. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember on like I think like my last one was like FIFA 18 or something. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. 
you know, you have those pre-season tournaments and it's like, uh, I guess in real life, I think it's the International Champions Trophy or whatever the hell they play in America nowadays. Uh, International Champions Cup, yeah. I've been, yeah. I mean, it's a cool event, you know, especially for oh, American sure. fans because we get to we get to I'm see sure these fun. major clubs. I'm sure it's fun, but it's a pre-season tournament at the end of the day. It doesn't yeah, mean anything. It, does, it doesn't mean anything, exactly. It's a fun opportunity, but it doesn't yeah. mean anything. And that's what yeah. the European Super League is now. It doesn't mean anything. They're, they're playing for nothing. They're playing for a made-up Super League trophy with a collection of a dozen arbitrarily selected teams that has yeah. no bearing on who the actual good teams are. It is a meaningless tournament, and it's a meaningless tournament that could change the foundation of football, change the way we watch soccer forever for a meaningless tournament. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, the last thing I'm going to say, because I need to get ready to go be depressed at Liverpool. <laughs> Um, yeah, but, I mean, it, I agree with what you said. The trophy at the end of the season should just be a giant dollar sign. Just <laughs> step it down. But congrats, you won, you won money ball. Well done. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the definition of money ball, I guess, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That seems to be the case. Sean, thank you so much, man, for for joining us and talking through this whole thing. And I think we can, uh, I think we can agree and say. I really hope this this doesn't happen. I really hope that there's going to be uh, some kind of some kind of last minute change and uh, this this whole situation is prevented. But you know, thanks so much for coming on and, and talking us through it. Uh, and please tell anyone who's happened to make it to the end of this thing where they can find you. Yeah, I commend you if you got through an hour of me and Griff ranting. Well done. <laughs> I hope it was entertaining, though. You know, I enjoy thinking of Messi and Timo Pukki playing for Norwich. Uh, um, if you didn't get 30 minutes through this video, then then you didn't see that, and you got to go back yeah. and watch it. If you just skip yeah. to the end, shame on you. Go back and watch our analysis of Messi and Pukki combining for 50 goals in the Premier League. <laughs> exactly. But now you can uh, find me on good old Twitter. It's just Sean Goodwin KC. S H A U N Goldwyn K C. Well, thanks, Sam. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, remember to subscribe here on GA Sports for more of whatever this was. And uh, and what else can we say? I hope this doesn't happen. And if it does, you can bet we'll be talking more about it in the future as it uh, starts to become more of a reality. So again, thank you so much for making it all the way through this thing. Subscribe. We appreciate you.